Okay, now we're taking up H5. If you want. Tip one. And Eric is going to do a walkthrough. It's a five page bill. So let's go with it. Okay. Yes. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Sears. Good morning again, everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick uh, for the record with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to do a walkthrough of H551, which is an act relating to prohibiting racially and religiously restrictive covenants. Indeed. Uh, so just a moment to explain what this is. Uh, the, the word covenant, generally speaking, just means an agreement. Co that's for the uh, definition of that term. But this refers to something specific, a racially or religiously restrictive covenant. And that's a very specific uh, term. What it refers to is uh, an agreement, either in a, gre in a deed or that's referenced in a deed, uh, that basically says that uh, someone who owns property can't sell that to another person on the basis of the person's race or on the versus basis of that person's religion. Now, these racially restrictive covenants were uh, quite commonly used in the United States for a period of time. Many of them still exist. Uh, the, the way that it most commonly worked actually is that, for example, it would be, say, a subdivision or a development uh, that would be uh, being built and there would be a separate list of covenants, in other words, agreements about what could be done on the property. And the covenant would, covenants would include all kinds of things, like maybe you can't operate a business uh, it, within the home. You can only, uh, the home must be a certain setback from the street. You can't hang, you, know, you can't put this or that on the property. Um, and it would be a long hang laundry hour. That was McCormick's. Yeah, they have that bill here. Yeah, we yes. Did. <laughs> that one as well, exactly, exactly. Um, but uh, it was not uncommon at all for within that list uh, to be a racially or restrictive covenant. Um, they were, uh, uh, and I can read one to the committee if that would be helpful, uh, but I think you understand how that they work. But if you want to hear the language of one, let me know. I have a couple, uh, couple I could. Uh, but uh, uh, they, as I mentioned, the covenants were in a separate document most often known as the list of covenants for this subdivision or this development, and they would be recorded in the land records and the deeds would incorporate them by reference. The deed would say, hey, this property is subject to the covenants that are recorded at page so-and-so of the town land records, and that's where they would be. Uh, now, the and they, another important point is that they, in legal terminology, those covenants, they run with the land. So in other words, Every person who buys it after the after they were initially um, they were initially recorded in the land records, the property remains subject to it. So even you know the the deed will say it's subject to the these covenants recorded at page so and so, and they remain that way for subsequent purchasers of the property. Now, back in 1948, the U.S. Supreme Court decided a very well known case called Shelley v. Kramer that said these racially and religiously restrictive covenants were, were void, they were unconstitutional and unenforceable, but they didn't actually, uh, you know, they're, not, they're still there on the books and they still do run with the land, even though they cannot be enforced uh, because it would be unconstitutional to do so. And that's what this bill proposes to do, is to address the fact that they are still there. They may not be enforceable, but they are still attached to the property. The properties are still subject to them. And so it what the bill does is a couple of a couple of things in general to address that situation. First of all, it says that, um, well, at least going forward, and this is we're moving on to page two now, I skipped the findings, which I, I certainly could read, but I know the committee can just read those on their own time as well, because we're getting short of time. Um, but uh, substantively, moving on to page two, that so the first thing the bill says, all right, going forward, after the effective date of Ju or July 1st, 2022, Deeds cannot contain these religiously restrictive covenants. They are, and um, they just are prohibited, and they they are going to be null and void. Subdivision two says, "All right, well, what if, what if a deed already has them? Well, if they already uh, are in there, then the, then um, regardless of when, uh, the restrictive covenant is void and unenforceable." Um, so, of course, the rest of the deed is enforceable, but it's this restrictive covenant that's cross-referenced. It's hereby declared void contrary to the public policy of Vermont, um, and it will be uh, unenforceable in the future. Uh, and um, the uh, method that the uh, bill provides to 
essentially cure the deed of this reference to these restrictive covenants, it creates this, and this is moving on to subsection B now on page two, this is a pretty simple and inexpensive process for anyone uh, to remove one of these existing restrictive covenants. They, you know, in other words, you don't, it specifically says you don't need to uh, hire an attorney. It says on, on uh, uh, toward the bottom of subsection B that you prepare, we prepare what's known as a certificate of release. You can do it without an attorney and it gives you a form as well. It's another way to try and make it simple and inexpensive is to actually provide a statutory form uh, that a person could could use. And if they if they use that form, um, then this releases uh, the property uh, from that covenant. Because remember, I said, even though the Supreme Court said, yes, that's true, they're unenforceable, but they still run with the land. They're still subject to it. Well, this is a release. So the um, property will no longer be subject to that covenant if one of these certificates is properly um, uh, filled out and um, uh, recorded in the land records and notarized and recorded in the land records, which uh, it is uh, required that that process be followed if you're going to um, take advantage of the ability that the statute gives to to have this release, this covenant gets released. Um, so the form is the statutory form is based on other statutory forms uh, for notarization that um, that are elsewhere in the green books. Uh, you'll see that the covenant is the specific real, uh, language on page three that says uh, that's the covenant contained in this instrument is released. Um, so it's officially done. It's acknowledged before our notary public toward the bottom of page three and over onto the top of page four. Um, and that's also boilerplate, boilerplate uh, notary public acknowledgement language. Uh, you'll see subsection, or sorry, section three is... Uh, uh, a fee waiver provision. So what this does is because there's typically a fee required when you record documents in the land records. And in order to make this certificate of release official and have it be uh, accomplish the legal purpose of releasing uh, this covenant has to be recorded in the land records. Um, that ordinarily uh, comes with a fee. And uh, what this does is that it waives that fee um, for recording for this particular type of document. So if, if you're recording one of these certificate of releases to remove a racially or religiously restrictive covenant, um, then the uh, then the fee that's ordinarily charged is waived. Um, same thing for a deed correction. So if you wanted to... Who's losing the money? The... Um, town clerk sorry. town clerk yes and there was we can uh the jfo testified that the uh financial effect would be uh pretty minimal but you could get that and there was a, a i think a fiscal note done uh for that as well um okay. so that might also be testimony that you would want to hear too okay um peggy for next week would set up somebody from joint fiscal whoever worked on this can I ask a question? Can I just ask a question? Yes. Um, Eric, but wouldn't this, I mean, doing away with the fees is one thing if there are only a few properties, but some towns may have many, many properties that have these covenants and mm -hmm. therefore have a different impact in different towns. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me it could be a burden in some towns. Yeah, I think it, 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 you're right, Senator Nicka, that it depends on how many of how many properties are out there that have these covenants attached to them. And uh, um, it's difficult to, to project that. Uh, you could ask some of your witnesses if they might have some knowledge of how, how prevalent they are. But I, I think you're right. There is uh, uh, some bit of unknown there with respect to that. So this is already illegal. It's in, unenforceable as is, correct? Correct. So this is just, for example, Vermont has certain laws in the books that are unconstitutional. This is just make you know clearing up the unconstitutional um, deeds. Yeah, that's a. I think that's a good analogy, Senator Sears. Yeah, that uh, uh, something so, that's. Uh, yeah, go it, ahead. Does, so it doesn't include those that um, deeds that wouldn't allow a family or, you know, you have trailer uh, in my district, there's a, 
a number of places that don't allow children. Um, there's a trailer park for senior citizens, basically. This wouldn't um, prohibit that, I don't think. It right. doesn't touch but, any of those types of deeds or covenants. Exactly. Only only racially or religiously restricted covenants would, would be affected. So may I ask a question? Yep. So this says that after July 2022, there they they can't be in any deeds, but for ones before that, it's up to the current owner if they want to um, file one of these um, um, release of the covenant, right? So yes. nobody nobody has to do it. But um, am I right about that? Yes, absolutely. It's not mandatory. It's whether the property owner would like to do it. Yeah. I wonder how many property owners know that that, right. even if that's even in their deeds. I have no idea if it's in our deed. I never looked at it. I've quite a few places know already. It seems to me that I've heard, and where I know near me, like big universities had them from very old times, big tracts of land that they own, also like um, different camps. Mm -hmm. I don't mean like the Girl Scout camp, but I mean bigger camping areas that like when people went to camp with big groups. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Isn't that Shopping what malls. In case any of you are really interested in the subject, Bor Yang gave me a book called Color of Law, which is a fairly recent book, but it's like the noted authority on this subject describing every possible example you could think of. It really is quite bizarre because in my early days, I did real estate dabbling in it. And I can recall provisions that I looked at trying to figure out why the heck would they put that in there? But after reading that book, it was very apparent what they put that in there. They were trying to manipulate in neighborhoods to make sure that they were correct for whoever was in the neighborhood. Right now we have Daniel. Is Daniel Richardson here, Peggy, or in the room? Yeah, right here. Yeah. Right behind right me. There he is. Here from Dan now. Uh, the sure. city attorney yeah, for to the, chair. the city of Burlington, and uh, right. welcome, Dan. Uh, nice to see you back. Thank you, Chair Chair Sears. And if no one objects, I may just remove my mask yeah. for clarity purposes. I always Please sense myself as muffled when I'm wearing it, speaking. Uh, oh, so it also it fogs up your glasses. <laughs> 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 Well, th thank you all uh, for having me here today and for considering this bill. I think it's um, it's an important bill, um, and I want to sort of outline some of the points. I think the questions have already sort of primed for. So a lot of the impetus for this legislation came out of a conversation that occurred between my office and the uh, REIB department in the city of Burlington. Um, this was about the issue that um, if you read the color of law, um, you know, the history of a lot of these great covenants, there's, there's, there's multiple histories, but probably the bulk of them were written sometime between the 1930s and as late as uh, the early, uh, early 50s. Uh, and the Federal Housing Administration actually uh, promoted the use of these covenants. Um, there was a process of redlining. Uh, that identified neighborhoods often of that were owned by people of color um, as unfavorable. Um, and uh, for any new development uh, loans, they were required. In some cases, developers couldn't get federally backed mortgages unless they included these covenants in their uh, in their deeds and subdivision regulations. Um, they were strongly encouraged by the Housing Administration. And in fact, when Shelley versus Kramer came out in 1948. Uh, the head of the Federal Housing Administration fought the application of the uh, result of Shelley versus Kramer uh, for several years. And in fact, the use of these restrictive covenants continued um, in some cases into the 1960s. Uh, so, you know, what has changed is that um, fair housing laws have come up and uh, the Courts have built on Shelley versus Kramer in a number of state court decisions and have largely expanded the use of it. So um, the chair, chair Sears is absolutely correct in that um, you couldn't go to court and enforce one of these racial covenants today. Um, but uh, Eric is also correct in that they sit in the deeds 
um, and there is no legislation that makes them illegal. And I think the analogy that Chair Sears put forward is an apt one. Uh, for years, uh, 13 BSA started with the uh, abortion restriction law, even though that had essentially been uh, a nullity since the 1970, since 1970 um, in the late 80s. Um, this is one of those situations where it, it is arguably going to stay unenforceable in the courts. Um, but I think this is an important message that you know the judiciary has spoken and has said these are unenforceable, these are unconstitutional. Uh, and this is an opportunity for the legislative and executive branches to join that uh, statement. Bless you. Um, It'll keep on. Okay. Uh, so this is an opportunity to, to strike out these uh, and void out uh, these provisions. Um, the, you know, and I think it also strengthens, and I don't want to in any way, shape or form, you know, present this as sort of a fear mongering, but court decisions always depend on the next court case. Um, precedent is overruled. Um, and so if one of the precedents that underlies the Shelley versus Supreme decision is ever revisited, then that reopens the door. This legislation helps close the door. Um, and it's also, I think, an important taking down of these covenants. Uh, I can only imagine as a seller who might have a piece of property and come across this covenant and find it still active on the property, it, it's an unwelcome sign. Um, or you know someone of a certain religious faith, um, and and actually the religious covenants are probably the one that has been most famous in Vermont. Uh, I found a New York Times article from August of 1986 when uh, Justice Rehnquist was being nominated for Chief Justice U.S. Supreme Court. He had a place in Greensboro that had a religious restrictive covenant that did not allow him ostensibly to sell his property to anyone of the Hebrew faith. Um, and apparently Greensboro had a number of these. Uh, and then Attorney General Jeff Amistoy said, they're unenforceable because of Shelley Brooks' Kramer, but you'd have to go to court to get this removed. Um, and the town clerk said that there were dozens of them in the Greensboro town records. Back to your point on this. Yes. Uh, so, you know, what we designed, what we, in, in working with Eric um, on this, I think what we aim for in this is really the first two, the first provision is the key one, which is let's make this void. Let's make this void prospectively saying you cannot add these to these. And let's make this void retrospectively saying that these are no longer enforceable or legal under Vermont law. Um, and the, the other provision about allowing the certificate to be filed, and you know, certainly there's there's a split in thinking about how that works. And, and in speaking with the REIP department, you know, one of the early versions of this um, contained language that would actually preserve the covenant, uh, in part because it's the idea that we shouldn't um, erase this ugly, this history as ugly as it is. It should be a reminder that there was a point in time where these type of things existed. Um, that ran into certain problems that with the title companies because of a fear that you start to have these the requirement that these things come forward or requirement that there's disclaimer language put into the deed and then you start to create clouds on title. And I think that's an issue that really hasn't been fully worked out. And uh, one of the compromises we, we struck was, let's have this just a certificate instead. If somebody wants to go and affirmatively put onto their land records this release, they should be able to. It should be simple. They shouldn't require a lawyer. Um, and, you know, I think because we're talking about a fraction of a fraction uh, of people that would not only have these covenants in their land, records, um, but um, a fraction of them are going to actually go to the additional step of, of disclaiming them, um, we felt that it was, it was something that was right to do to simply make it um, a, at very low threshold cost of no cost for uh, individuals seeking to put that on there. I think practically what's going to happen um, from having done real estate law for a number of years is no one's going to stumble upon this because nobody goes into the land records except lawyers um, for just the fun of it. Um, but what's going to happen is somebody's going to be selling the property or buying a property 
and they're going to discover this in the midst of that land record search. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, they'll make that election to disclaim uh, the, the deed. And so the actual certificate is just going to be one of a number of papers that is done in a land transaction. And I think that's a fairly minimal burden for clerks uh, for doing this because they'll already be receiving payment from uh, the actual land transaction with all the other uh, papers being recorded. This is just one extra page. It's unlikely to be, I think, a flurry or a rush of individuals filing this that might overwhelm the, uh, the clerk's office. I can say that the city clerk of Burlington, even if you do put a, a number on this, um, I would strongly suspect um, in the conversations we've had, we'll make this free for Burlington residents um, because it's important enough to the city. Um, and I think it's something we want to make sure it remains a very low threshold so it can be accomplished. So, um, you know, we certainly support this as a city. Um, if there are these racially restricted covenants from the FHA days, they're probably going to be in Burlington because there was a substantial development. Um, I expect you'll hear from Jim Knapp in a little bit. I've had conversations with Jim um, you know, in his 40 years, and, and I consider Jim to be the, um, the expert on titles in Vermont. Uh, he's never come across a sort of live or fresh version of these type of restrictive covenants. They are of all a sort of older uh, vintage, um, but he has come across them. Uh, and he has come across them in a number of towns, and Burlington included. Um, and so, you know, the other part of this is, you know, REIB was at one point considering going through the land records to start to identify these, these type of covenants. And one of the things this legislation does is it allows them to take those resources and use them in different areas because this essentially nullifies it and it provides a way forward. They can, we can have a form there at the city clerk's office. So if somebody wants to do it, we can do it right then and there. They don't have to even go home um, and they can just simply fill it out. And I think that that addresses this sort of lurking remnant uh, of a time. So the language of the covenant remains in place. This is a page that's added to the record just for action. Correct. Right. So the history is the the history history there. History. Yeah. yeah, what they wanted, yeah. I, what yeah. REIB was proposing was actually carrying forward language so that every deed would say, if I was to buy a house that had a racially restrictive covenant, at one time, even if I filed the certificate, I would still have to say this property was at one point in time, you know, um, uh, subject to a racially restrictive covenant as a way of sort of bringing history forward. Mm -hmm. That's where the title insurance companies have said, yeah, that's that that could be a thorny issue because mm -hmm. what does it mean if it doesn't if it isn't included? And so I think for the time being, at least, we felt I felt that it was more important to get this bill across than to, then that's an issue we can always revisit. Um, and I think in the process of filing certificates, we'll be creating a database because, you know, we can we can track and I intend to have the, the city clerk track, you know, how many certificates are we seeing? What is filed? What is, um, you know, what does this look like? Um, you know, because it's, it, as I think it's been indicated, you know, certain properties were subject to these. Between the 1930s, you know, the 1930s and the 1960s, there were the bulk of them, but a number of them predate. If there was a camp, if there was a group that felt, you know, they had to restrict these type of things for whatever uh, belief system that they had, um, they do exist. Uh, but uh, you know, they often represent the fears of the of the time. Um, but I, I think that it will be interesting to see how, how these pan, pan out because I don't think we have an accurate count uh, of what they are. But with this bill, we would, I, I believe that would it would create a channel forward out of this so that it effectively closes that door, as I said before. So Thank that's, you, Dan. Uh, you're welcome. Good. Thank you. uh, I'm wondering if there, if there are any questions from the committee for Dan about any of this testimony. My only question that comes up, what is more likely in Vermont, the religious or the racial? Or do you I, have I, any idea? It was religious. I, I don't know. I think in certain areas, certainly for if you took Greensboro, for example, it would far 
will more likely be the religious because that just seems to have been the people that owned land there. Um, that was the covenant that they used. And the town clerk back in 1986 seemed to be very familiar with these re religiously restricted covenants. Whereas I suspect if you're looking at Burlington, there's going to be more racially restrictive covenants or South Burlington, any area that's going to be under that sort of traditional FHA period of time where the federal government was, in, was endorsing um, these racially restricted covenants. Interesting that the federal government actually endorsed them. Well, they had they had policies also right. against loaning, making loans, and um, no, no, I understand. I mean, I, you, if you read the legislative intent, it's clear. Read the book. Question eye opener is. Okay. Um, we have is is Terry Course room? Yes, she's here. She's here. For any more questions for Dan? I just note in passing, Dan, it's an inexpens inexpensive process right now, unless and until Tyler Technologies takes over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I will, I will leave that comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to put a disclaimer in, Joe, that Tyler Technologies is not allowed to deal with it? <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> Okay, uh, Terry, Executive Director of the Vermont Bar Association. Thank you, Senator yes. Spears, and so nice to be back in your room. Well, it would be nice if I were there too, but <laughs> conditions don't allow. Uh, for the uh, record, Terry Corson, Vermont Bar Association. And my, my testimony will be brief. I'm mainly just reporting that when this bill came before the House Judiciary, I posted it to the real property section and to the municipal law section for comment. We did receive very broad general support for the bill. Some tweaking to the language that um, Dan has referred to from title insurance and practitioners. So the version that was passed by the House was agreed to by all of the persons who have responded to that. I did also post it um, when you all scheduled it for a testimony and received just one comment yesterday from Carl Lisbon, who's involved oh, yeah. with the Uniform Law Commission. And he indicated, which was I wasn't aware of, I don't know if Dan or Jim were, uh, were but um, apparently the Uniform Law Commission is considering a Restrictive Covenants and Deeds Act that would have similar goals and end results. Um, so he had in his comments said, oh, would the committee uh, consider postponing this until next year when the Uniform Law Commission may have finalized its process? No. So <laughs> I, I had asked you, is there anything in H551 with which you disagree? And he hasn't responded. And, and just okay. looking at the, the proposal, it is different. It's more broad. It also includes a mandatory disclaimer in every deed. Uh, whether it has a covenant or not, just saying that if there's anything in this deed that violates any federal law regarding discrimination, it's not enforceable. It's it's definitely much more broad. Um, so that I just wanted to report that that's the only comment. I know in discussing with uh, Dan and Jim, one thought was if the Uniform Law Commission does come out with something next year or whenever, they wish to perhaps propose an amendment if H5 throw one passes, then that might be the time for that. But that's really my only um, purpose is to report back on what the um, members responded to the posts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we move slowly, but uniform. <laughs> 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 Here's all the people working on the uniform law commission. Thank you, Carl, for the suggestion. I think it's the feeling of the committee that we should act now and that you can always amend the bill depending upon how the uniform law commission, uh, what the, the uniform law might look like. So, Senator Sears, can I make a comment here? Sure. I, I don't know if other people got these or not, but I got some emails from people in Tennessee and different places about this and about what we should be doing in Vermont. And I found out this morning that there was some kind of a, a back door into our agenda setting system. And so the agendas, the potential agendas before they were actually um, listed were getting out there and so some of us have been getting lobbyists from all over the country are 
weighing in on the issues that we're dealing with. And some of those, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, good to know where that's why they, they closed the door. So you will they won't get it anymore. But these lobbyists are it, it was that one of our committee assistants from the net from uh Senate Health and Welfare who realized it and brought it up to IT and said, you know, that they were exactly what you're saying before we were publishing the agendas. They were getting it, and yeah, he found it, so that was pretty huge. Yeah. We, we have Jim Knapp. Are there any other questions for Terry? On this bill, I did. Jim Knapp, where is Jim Knapp? Oh, he's he's, on the, he's in, he's right remote. There. Oh, great. Right. You want to join us? Good morning, Jim. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Jim Knapp, James Knapp, I'm the co chair of the real estate section of the Bar Association. So perhaps the group that most directly deals with these issues. I don't have a lot to add to what anybody has said after careful consideration of the bill with Dan Richardson and Eric. We all agree that this bill represents uh, an appropriate means of moving forward. And we agree that the language is fine and I'm happy to answer questions. But beyond that, I don't really have much to say. Okay. Well, I always like to hear that. That, that was brief. Uh, <laughs> are there any questions for Jim? No. Are, are you? I'll have a question. Are you doing some real estate? I'm not sure where you're located, but are you doing real estate in other areas around the state where you've seen these? Um, I uh, technically uh, retired as of December 31st, so I'm not doing anything oh. related to oh, much wow. other than contributing to legislative hearings periodically and a few other things, but uh, I was in practice for 41 years before I retired, uh, primarily working in the Northwestern section of the state. And I can think of only two examples where I've run into this. One is Mayfair Park in South Burlington, and one was a subdivision in Burlington, the name of which uh, actually escapes me at the moment. Um, I did start my career doing title searches in the Hardwick and Greensboro area, but I don't ever remember running across a covenant. That being said, that was close to 50 years ago, so I might not remember anyway. Um, so I've seen a very limited number of these, and I suspect from a fiscal standpoint, most towns won't even notice the, that this is a rounding error in the total recording fees that the towns where this is likely to be an issue um, would come up. So, I mean, Mayfair Park has about 45, 50 lots in it. And they went through the process of amending their covenants to actually amend and restate to remove the objectionable covenant uh, a few years ago. So in theory, the association itself has taken care of this um, for that particular subdivision. Right. Any other questions for Jim? Jim, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to take this bill up again next week. Um, Mark Hughes has requested to testify, and there may be others. So if anybody else um, wants to testify on this bill, they should contact Peggy.